Hello, and welcome. Even a casual observer sitting in this cockpit would know that the business of this aircraft is the killing of other aircraft. You sit up high in the pointy end, surrounded by a canopy that affords you an excellent view of the sky around you. Right, left, up, or down, you see it all. And looking straight ahead, there's the HUD, the VSD, the tubes, all visible in a single glance. And right below them, instruments for weapon availability, countermeasures, navigation, engine control, and fuel management. There is almost no mistaking it. This is an air superiority fighter. Yesterday afternoon, we introduced you to this aircraft's ANAPG-63 radar. You learned the basics of the VSD and the LRS mode. Wow, what a beautiful morning to be in the air. Now, as I was saying, oh, we've got some traffic below us there to our left, and unless I'm mistaking, there should be someone off to our right. Ah, there he is, silhouetted against the moon. We fight for different reasons, but this is why we fly. You don't see things like that with your feet firmly on the ground. Okay, where was I? Yesterday, you got to play a bit with this aircraft's radar, turning it on, learning a bit about the VSD, and, uh use the LRS or range while scan mode. This morning we'll be taking you a step further. We'll begin locking aircraft up and putting missiles into the air. You'll see this aircraft's radar in STT or single target track and flood modes. Okay, since we're going to be selecting and firing weapons today, let's take a look at the PACs. The PACs or Programmable Armament Control Set tells us what we have on board. A centerline fuel tank, right and left fuel pylons are empty, chafe and flare counters, cannon rounds remaining, the gun is set to a high rate of fire. What we are primarily interested in though is our weapon station inventory. This is a top-down view of our wings. Our pointy end is at the top and our tail is at the bottom. We have on board AIM-120s and AIM-7s. The system defaults to pylon 1, but you cycle weapons with the D key. Notice standby changing to ready when the weapon is selected. Since we'll be using the AIM-7s today, we'll leave that selected and turn on our radar. Expanding the range to 80 nautical miles, and oh, we have a contact. He's out at about, oh, 68 or 9 uh, nautical miles on the left edge of our scan zone. Let's go ahead and turn into him. keeping an eye on the VSD as we turn, pulling him in more towards the center of our beam. Looking closer at the HUD, we have AIM-7 selected, and there are four remaining on our pylons. And because we are in LRS mode, there is no targeting information being displayed, but the selected AIM-7 is ready and waiting, so move the TDC up over one of the contacts, press tab to designate. This puts us into STT, or single target track mode. The designated contact is now locked, and notice the change. All of our radar energy is now focused on this single target. And that's a mixed blessing. On the one hand, the other contact, and indeed all other contacts, have disappeared from our radar screen. We no longer have any idea of where they're going or what they're doing. But on the other hand, we have a great deal of information on the contact we have locked. Okay, I'm going to freeze the display for a moment and uh, give us time to talk. And no, you can't do this in the sim. Okay, so what do we see here? His true airspeed is 267 knots. His aspect is 15 degrees to the right, and he's on a heading of 205 degrees. His altitude is exactly 12,000 feet. And we're closing with a combined airspeed of uh, 771 knots. Along the bottom of the display, we see that we are in STT, single target track mode, but we know that already. Our own ground speed is 527 knots. The NCTR, non-cooperative target recognition system, uh, is not able yet to identify what kind of aircraft we have locked. We're still too far away. But if everyone's flight path, altitudes, and speed remain the same, 
the pre-launch timer. This T here indicates that we will reach missile minimum range in 108 seconds. And if we want to point our own nose directly at this guy, we need to turn to a heading of 036 degrees. Finally, he is currently 52 nautical miles away, as indicated both here by the 52 and here by the uh, carrot on our range scale. Now, I mentioned missile minimum range. That's the bottom line on this scale here called the DLZ, or dynamic launch zone. And the DLZ is, well, dynamic. It expands or contracts depending on comparative altitudes, range, closure rates, etc. It starts at this triangle here and extends to the minimum range line here. In simplistic terms, the top line and triangle are the maximum range of your missile. This box here encloses the ranges within which you have the greatest probability of scoring a kill, with missile RTR forming the top of the box. Range, turn, and run, RTR. Even if he turns and runs, your missile has the energy to reach him. And finally, for the time being, think of this line here at the top of the DLZ as R max. That's the range at which your missile has enough energy to reach your target, assuming the target does not maneuver, change altitude, change airspeed, etc. In other words, it'll reach him if he's either completely oblivious or comatose. As you can imagine, an R max shot is an extremely low percentage shot. Okay, let's get back to real time. The RTR timer is ticking down again. Range, 50 nautical miles. Closure rate, about 770 knots. And so far, we've only been looking at the VSD. It's time for us now to take a look at what's going on on the HUD. Let's unlock the AIM-7 ready state showing on the HUD. TDC over to the second target and lock. Notice the change on the HUD. The AIM-7's ready or relaxed mode 8 degree circle has changed into a much tighter circle indicating that we have a lock. And let's freeze this. Okay, this solid circle here is called the steering dot. It's telling us both uh, which direction to steer to pull our target into the HUD, and it's also giving us an idea of how far outside of the HUD he is. This square out here is the target designation box. It's locked against the left side of the HUD because he's outside of our HUD view to the left side of our aircraft. If we turned to pull him into our HUD, then that box would surround him. He would be in its center. This is the range scale to the right side of the HUD, but inside the altitude tape, our focus is on the three heavy marks, the DLZ. The top mark is R max. The bottom mark is R min. In between the two is RTR. Repeated from the VSD, our combined uh, closure rate is 724 knots. And this line here will slowly be marching down the uh, range scale on the um, DLZ. And more information. We currently have AIM-7 selected, and we have four available. Below that is our speed, expressed as Mach. Below that number is the number of Gs we're pulling, currently 1.01. .01. And below that is our target's airspeed, also expressed as Mach. So, on the VSD, the target's uh, airspeed is expressed in TAS, true airspeed, but on the HUD, it's expressed as Mach. On the right side of the HUD, we have the range remaining between us and the target. The next two lines express nav information. We're pointing towards waypoint 2 and uh, 10.8 nautical miles away. That waypoint is actually behind us, so the ra that uh, range to that waypoint will be slowly increasing once we go back to real time. Below that is our target's general aspect, head-on, expressed as an H, and the last line on the HUD is the pre-launch timer, that T. We have 92 seconds if all things remain the same before this line here marches all the way down to, to the minimum range line here. Not to belabor the point, but you will get launch authorization at this heavy mark here, which is our max. But that's a very low percentage shot.
and your best chance for scoring a kill occurs when your target's range falls between RTR and missile minimum. So, for the moment, if you compare the information available on the VSD to that available on the HUD, when you are locked in outside of uh, launch range, there's actually more information available to you on the VSD. That's to, in part to keep the uh, HUD from becoming too cluttered. Okay, back to real time. We've been focused on this guy for quite a while, so uh, let's break lock and uh, see what's going on in the rest of the field. There we go, we got everybody back. Let's lock the friendly for a moment. I want to see his altitude, 10,000 feet. Okay, and what about this guy? Let's freeze this. First, I want you to notice what happened when I bumped the TDC up against the top of the range scale and locking him. It automatically bumped us up to the next longest range, 160 nautical miles, thereby drawing our contact down into the middle portion of the range scale. The other thing I want you to notice is the aspect. Because he is so close to head-on, the aspect is designated with an H for head-on rather than giving you a numerical readout. On the other hand, if this was a chase situation, that letter designation would be a T for tail-on. And back to real time. Break lock. Knock the range scale back down with the plus key. 80. Again, 40. Another quick lock on this guy. Altitude and everything else still looks the same. Break lock again so we keep an eye on the bigger picture. Now, in yesterday's introductory flight, we learned about the narrower 60 degree scan, 30 degrees either side of center line. We're in that now. Notice that the leftmost contact is fading because he's outside of the scan zone. However, what I didn't show you yesterday is that you can move the narrower scan zone left or right with the shift comma and shift front slash keys. We now have both contacts back again. Increasing the range scale so we'll have all four contacts. Notice now that the uh, rightmost contact is fading because he's outside of the scan zone. Shift the scan zone to the uh, right with the shift front slash. We've got him back again. So as you can tell the narrow 60 degree scan zone makes it difficult to keep track of aircraft separated horizontally. It's time to uh, lock up the closest contact again. We're approaching our max. Going to start turning into him. He's close enough now for the NCTR to get a read on him. This is an IL-76 cargo aircraft. Our max. Notice the two red launch lights as well as the change in the HUD. Let's freeze this and zoom in. Okay, so what's different? Well, most noticeable is the change in the AIM-7 circle. It's gone from that small, tight lock circle to the larger ASE, or allowable steering error circle, with its angle off indicator. The angle off indicator shows you where his nose is pointing. Right now, the target is pointing a bit to our right. Next, notice that something's been added to the target designation box. There is now a small triangle located beneath it. That's the in-range cue, and it's tied to the R-Max marker on the DLZ. It's simply telling you that if nothing changes, the target doesn't maneuver, change speed, altitude, your missile has enough energy to reach him. It's saying nothing about the likelihood of your hitting him. And one final note. Notice the uh, steering dot. We've pulled that inside the ASE allowable steering error circle. That's where it belongs. You should not launch unless that dot is inside that large circle. Or that's the way it is in the real world anyway. In the sim, you can actually get away launching with it outside that circle. But it's best to keep it inside when you launch. Okay, so what's the VSD been looking like during all this? Well, let's take a look. There has been one major change here as well. As with the HUD, that small AIM-7 STT lock circle has grown large. Unlike what we have on the HUD, however, there is no angle off line attached to the circle. That's because we can t actually tell the angle off from the PDT itself, or uh, primary designated target. 
notice this longer line extending down from the PDT. That's the target's nose, and at the moment this target is pointing towards us and just slightly toward our right. And as it's repeated on the HUD, the steering dot here has been pulled into the larger ASE circle. Okay, let's get back to real time. Okay, we're now inside our MAX on the DLZ, marching down toward RTR. Since cargo aircraft are not generally known for their maneuverability, I'm not going to wait until RTR to launch. We can actually get away with launching sooner. We'll launch now. Box 1, notice the new timer that's appeared. This is the post-launch timer. 14 seconds to intercept. The same information is repeated on the VSD. Back to the HUD. 9 seconds remaining. 5. 2. Timers run out, but wait for it. Boom. That post-launch timer makes its time determination based on the situation at launch. So when your target maneuvers, it'll take a bit more time for your missile to get there than the timer indicates. Now, there's another aircraft out here somewhere. By now, he should be within visual range. Ah, there he is, at the leading edge of that cloud. And this is that second hostile. We'll pull him into the HUD. And since we have a visual, we will not waste our time locking him up with a radar. We'll simply switch to flood mode. Notice the 12-degree reference circle. We just hold him inside this circle. Red launch lights are lit. Fox 1. By holding the target inside the circle, in essence, we are providing our own manual radar lock. We're simply flooding a 12-degree cone ahead of our nose with radar energy, and the missile is homing in on the reflections from the target. Notice that this mode provides you with no timing cues. Boom! We got them. And the only launch cues are the red launch lights on the canopy rail. I'm going to hold through this turn because I want to extend. We'll put those additional targets on our tail and give us time to talk a bit more about flood mode. Flood mode works really well when you already have the target in sight and you won't have any problem keeping your nose pointed toward him. It's quick and very straightforward. There is no need to uh, take the time to lock up the uh, target with radar. With an AIM-7 selected, the HUD looks identical to the AIM-7's ready state except that you have the larger 12 degree flood mode reference circle on the HUD. Looking down at the VSD, you'll see flood as the mode type, but it's at the top of the display as opposed to down in the corner. The radar limits are fixed at 12 degrees, and the antenna carrots are centered. Max range is 10 nautical miles, but that's dynamic. It can be and often is less. Back to long range scan, and let's reverse course. Okay, target's just starting to show up, about at around 40 nautical miles. And this one's a friendly. Quick look at longer range, make sure there's nothing else showing up that we need to be aware of. Now remember from yesterday's trending flight, circles are friendly, dashes are presumed to be hostile. Okay, let's settle in the, on this course and head toward them. We'll give it a minute or two for the range to close. Scanning out to 80 nautical miles, now 40. Circles are friendly. I cannot emphasize that enough. We do not shoot at circles. But watch, lock it, and all identification of friend or foe IFF information ceases. When in STT mode, you cannot tell by looking at the target bug whether you've got a friendly or a hostile locked. The only IFF information you'll have is via the NCTR. We now have locked a C-130. If the bad guys don't have C-130s, we know he's on our side. If they do, oh well. Dashes are hostile, locking the hostile. As you can see, this uh, lock is identical to the lock on the friendly. The target bug looks identical. And now we see that it's an IL-76 
the Ukrainians who are on our side fly IL-76s. So be sure to IFF the target before you lock it. Radar to 20 nautical miles. Now this is our friendly locked again. Now I'm going to pause this for a moment because I want to show you something. I said earlier that this line and this triangle here indicated our max. It's actually just a bit more complicated than that and you can see it here. The triangle is actually the range aerodynamic cue or our arrow. That's the maximum missile kinematic range. It assumes the target will not maneuver and that the missile is perfect. You won't get launch authorization here. The top line on the DLZ is actually the RPI, or Range Probable Intercept. This is the range at which your missile has enough energy to reach him if he takes minor evasive action. Think piston engine transports. In most cases, you'll see the greatest separation between RERO and the RPI cues when the target is close to the edge of the VSD. You won't be able to launch until RPI. Okay, back to real time. Okay, we've reached RERO. Max missile kinematic range. And for the AIM-7, RERO and RPI are virtually identical. Even with the target on the extreme edge of your radar. You'll reach RERO first, but not by a whole hell of a lot. Okay, we've broken lock on the friendly. Out to 40 nautical miles, nothing going on that we don't already know about, just the one hostile contact. By now, he should be in max missile range, so let's go ahead and lock him. Ah, perfect. We are now inside of max range, although that doesn't mean much given the situation. We know this target will maneuver. AIM-7 STT HUD. ASE circle with the angle offline. Steering dot towards the center of the ASE. In range Q under the target box. I'm going to hold off until we're just inside of RTR. Counting down, pre-launch timer now at 14 seconds. Notice the angle off the line, slowly rotating counterclockwise around the circle as we're slipping in more behind him. His nose is pointing more away from us. Fox 1. 8 seconds to impact. 7. 6. Notice the angle offline moving around the ASC as he turns away from us. Target box flashing as he enters the notch, but we got him just as he was breaking the lock. Well, that was close. He almost evaded our first missile by ducking into the notch. The notch? Well, it's the Doppler notch. And in simplistic terms, it's a way of making yourself disappear off of someone's radar screen. And he almost did it. Almost. But this is a discussion beyond the purview of the present training flight. But if you're beginning to get the impression that there's more to making a kill than simply putting a missile into the air, you're right. You need to understand your radar, how to use it, and how to interpret it. You need to understand its various modes. In yesterday's training flight, we looked at long-range scan, also known as range while scan. Today we looked at uh, single target track mode, or STT. We saw that this mode is a mixed blessing. On the one hand, it gives you a great deal of information about the target you have locked, but it has its downside. While you have the target locked, all the radar's energy is directed at that target. No other contacts are seen or displayed on the VSD. And so you lock the target at the cost of situational awareness. It's the price you pay. Also you saw that in the transition from RWS to STT, you lose IFF information. So be sure of your target before you lock it. Okay, I'm just slipping in behind this friendly C-130. I had him locked just to make that easier. Switch to flood mode, which is the other tracking mode that you saw today. In flood mode, you're simply flooding the sky ahead of you in a 12-degree cone. You pull the target aircraft into the cone and hold them there. Instead of the radar locking and holding the aircraft in the cone, you are doing it manually. Okay, I'll let him slip outside the cone and you'll see us lose the lock. There it goes. Pull him back 
towards the circle. And we have the lock again. Notice actually in the sim that he doesn't have to actually be exactly in the circle. Okay, back to range wall scan mode. And wave hello as we pass by. I'm sure we've made him extremely nervous. His raw has been screaming this entire time while we had him in an STT lock and also while we had him uh, in our sights in flood mode. I'm just going to circle around one more time. Betty's thinking to himself, shit, what is, what's he going to pull now? Actually, we're going to leave him alone. And just one last thing I want to review for this training flight. While in STT lock, you will get the uh, launch cues as soon as you are within maximum missile range. Keep in mind that there are two maximum ranges, or really three. There's RERO, or range aerodynamic, that's the uh, maximum missile kinematic range. Your missile will reach him as long as he does absolutely nothing. Beneath that is RPI. Range probable impact, where it'll reach him if he does minimal maneuvering. And finally, there's RTR, range turn and run. Your missile will reach him even if he turns and runs. And that concludes this training flight. Thank you. You have control.